Our God and our Father, we come again tonight because you desire that we gather around your word. We know that in the last days, perilous times will come because men will be going farther and farther away from the word of God. And he'll be gathering together men of their own liking because they have itching ears. But Father, you have given us this privilege in this church that every time we'll gather together and we'll listen to the pure word of God undiluted. Father, we're asking tonight that your spirit will apply this word in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. And we ask that as you strengthen us with the word, we'll respond by obedience to your word in Jesus' name. Cleanse us from the spirit of the last days and keep us ready for the coming of our Lord. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Tonight we have a rather long passage to study. Perhaps the longest we have studied at a time this whole year. We are at chapter 5 and we are going to look through from verse 17 to 42. I kept the passage as it is, even though it is long because it is a continuous narrative. And if we try to break into two or three studies, you may not be able to get the flow of it. And therefore, we have kept everything together. But we have divided into about six uh, subtitles so that you will be able to move from one point to the other without um, too much loss of the whole flow. Now, I've been talking to you about the church, the early church. And if there was anything that characterized the early church, it was this. They kept very close, very, very close to the revealed word of God. They had the letter of the word and they were in the spirit of the word. And there were two things in the church that I will want you to focus your attention upon. In fact, I want to give you very quickly before I get into the study, six words. Six words. Uh, about the early church. One, there was purity in the early church. They had been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. They had been washed and made white in the blood of Jesus. And they were living such a remarkable holy life that there was just a transparent purity in the church. Number two, there was power in that church. Everywhere they went, as they called on the name of Jesus Christ, they were manifesting the power and the authority in that name. And let me tell you something. Where you find those two words, purity and power, the devil can't stand it. Because the Bible says from the lips of Jesus Christ that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church of Christ. And you know, when Satan found purity in the church and power in the church, he trembled in his boots. And therefore, he tried to bring in, this is the third word, pollution. There was purity in the church, power in the church, but he knew if he could bring in some polluting element, some pollution, defile it, model it up, bring sin in the rank and file of the children of God, he knew that he'll be able to overcome. You know what God did? Number four, he brought in purging. He purged out the pollution that came in the church. Because, you know, to keep the purity and the power in the church, you must keep the pollution away. And to do that, God needed to step in. And there was purging. But then, the world will not just fold their arms. Because this new faith, new religion, as they knew it, was just coming on with purity and power, and they were marching on. So the world brought in persecution. There was purity, there was power, and the pollution that tried to come in couldn't stay because of the purging that came from above. And then the world wanted to just wipe the whole church away, and it tried that by bringing in persecution. But you know, the response of the church? Persistence. Uh, they remained persistent. 
and they will not allow what the devil was bringing in to stay and they will not allow what the world was bringing in to affect them and so the church kept moving forward in the unfinished task of world evangelization empowered by God the ministers were using the power of the spirit to win the laws and as Satan moved in to pollute the church with a sin of pretense in the early church there was an immediate purging and though persecution arose from the world the church was not intimidated not at all because for the church there was nothing to fear the church couldn't fear sin or Satan or the world or anything whatever there was nothing to fear and even though they had the purity and the power and the prosperity and even the popularity they couldn't lose their purity and in the very midst of serious persecution there was what we call spiritual productivity and so as we get into the study of tonight I want you to have all that at the back of your mind and uh, I'll read to you I will not read the whole um, you know to start with I'll just read a bit at a time and then I will explain to you as we go on uh, you know I told you last week when I was talking to you on power in the church God's power in the church and I, I told you about the signs and wonders that were taking place those miracles were taking place and there were signs pointing to the Lord Jesus Christ and it made everybody around to wonder let me read it again to you from verse 12 and by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch and of the rest does no man join himself to them but the people magnified them and the believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes both of men and of women in so much that they brought forth the seed into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them that were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed everyone. That's the background of the church. And now I want to tell you the new thing that happened today. And uh, as I say all these things, you understand that these things are written for us so that at least in our church here, we can catch a glimpse of the power, the purity, the persistence in the early church and then we'll be able to stay true to the word of God. You know when our brother was leading the chorus, he said, keep me true Lord, keep me true. There is a race time must run. There is a fight to fight. Keep me true. Every hour, keep me true. You know, you need to pray that prayer. Not only to sing it, but to tell the Lord, you know, there ought to be purity, there ought to be power, there ought to be persistence in the church. I know, Lord, I'm depending upon your grace to keep me true. And you, you sang that other chorus, we are kept by the power of God. Oh, yes. That is the only thing that can keep the power of God, the authority of the name, the dependence upon the blood of Jesus Christ. And you know, if we'll just stay true to what we read, what we study, and what we sing, this church will be able to stand in the same purity, power, and persistence of the early church. Now, you see, when all these things were going on, there was one reaction from the people of the world. And that is what we find in verse 17 and verse 18. The church had so great a power that even the world could not withstand it. And they felt they must do something about it. And here we have the persecution of the Galileans. Verse 17, then the high priest rose up. And all they that were within, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. That means rage, anger, wrath, bitterness. They were so unhappy. Well, they were unhappy for a number of reasons. 
they had been the religious people controlling the minds of the people. But now this uh, new group rose up, despised group. And as they rose up, there was so much purity in their midst. There was so much power in their midst. And uh, these uh, apostles, the Galileans, they were calling back to mind the days of Moses. As the rod of Moses was mighty in his hand, so the name of Jesus was mighty in their mouth. As the rod of Moses was performing wonders and miracles in Egypt, so the power of the name of Jesus was healing the sick and raising those who are lame and working signs and wonders. And as Joshua was marching forth, and the walls of Jericho were, were falling down, so also as these apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, as they were marching forth, the walls of sicknesses and deformity and evil, they were collapsing and falling down. And as Elijah came, and, and he stood on the mountain, and fire came from heaven, so these people, they, they came forth, and a spiritual fire was falling down, burning all the evil spirits, and they were crying with loud voices, and they were coming out. And you know, as David was reigning on the throne, so even these, these apostles were reigning on the throne, invisible throne, but the power of their throne was being seen everywhere. And it bothered the Sadducees. It bothered the people that were looking at them. And so they arrested them. The sect of the Sadducees and the priests, they rose up against them. And were told in verse 18, they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in common prison. Uh, you know, that's not the end of the whole story. If that were the end, Satan would have won. But you know, he never wins. If you keep standing to the truth, Satan will never win in your life. You know, the Sadducees may lay hold on you. They may catch you, arrest you, and lock you up. But if you keep on standing true, if you keep on on the word of God, that will not be the end of the story. Something else will follow. But now, let me talk to you about these people. In Acts chapter 1, verse 11. Acts chapter 1 verse 11 which also said ye men of Galilee why stand ye gazing up into heaven the angels came and you know the, you know the name they called the apostles and the disciples ye men of Galilee in chapter 2 I'm reading there from verse 7 and they were all amazed and marveled saying one to another, behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Now, what's the importance of that word, Galileans? Men of Galilee. Now, turn to John, chapter 7. I'm reading from verse 45. It is written in the prophets, and they shall all be taught of God. That's chapter 6. Chapter 7 verse 45. Then came the officers to the chief priests and, and Pharisees and they said unto them, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? But these people who know it not the law are cursed. Nicodemus says unto them, He that came to Jesus by not being one of them, does our Lord judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? Then answered and said, They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Search and look, for out of Galilee ariseth no prophet. You know, the thing that surprised the Pharisees and the Sadducees is that in their own understanding, it was impossible for a prophet having the power of God to arise out of Galilee. And these apostles were Galileans. And it, they didn't expect that the power of God could flow through them. Because they said, search and look. 
can a prophet having the power of God, having the authority of heaven, having the sanction, the approval from the throne of the universe arise out of Galilee? And uh, when the power fell on the day of Pentecost, the very thing that surprised the people that were looking at them is that these are Galileans. And what we see in them, what we see upon them, appears to be the power of God. How come that these Galileans are speaking in a language of heaven, in another language? And so the persecution came on because they were thought of as peddlers of a new doctrine. They shouldn't be manifesting power. Because it is not scientific, it is not historically correct that uh, they will do that because none of their descendants have been able to do that. Well, they missed the point. God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound those who are wise. He has chosen the base things of the world to confound them that are mighty. And do you know the Lord is still doing the same thing today? In a lowly place, the Lord is working his wonders. Don't be surprised. When God wanted to make man, he didn't use gold, he used dirt, dust, soil. Something you will not expect. Don't be surprised. When God wanted to heal Naaman, he didn't use Sabana and Papa, wonderful rivers in Damascus. He used Jordan, the dirty river in Samaria. Don't be surprised when God wanted to bring his own beloved son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, into this world. He was born not in Jerusalem and not in the palace. He was born in a manger. And when God wanted to bring power on the day of Pentecost, it did not fall in the temple. It did not fall in the palace of the king. It fell in an upper room where some disciples were holding onto themselves behind, behind closed doors and they were afraid for their lives. You know, God always works in that way. He's always doing that. How did he call Moses? Where did he call Moses? At the back of the desert. Just a shepherd. From where did he raise up Joseph? Right from the prison. He called him and he became prime minister in Egypt. Where did he, where did he, call, where did he see? Even that man, Elijah. Well, we, we, we are not told, but then we are told eventually, by the time the power will fall, he called him out of the widow's house. And he said, go to Ahab and show yourself unto him. You know when he called David before he started manifesting the power of God in his life? Just a shepherd boy from the wilderness. And he came with a sling and stones and he killed Goliath. You know what, Je what Jeremiah said when God called him? He said, ah, I'm a child. I cannot speak. And God said, don't say you are a child. I will put my word in your mouth and you'll go. Wherever I send you, you will pull down. You will destroy. You will build up. You will raise up. Where did God show his power? Right in Babylon. When those people were right inside the fire. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The son of God came as the first person in that fire. That's the way God works. Don't be surprised. And so these people were surprised. Because they did not know that God will choose the people that are despised. And the people that are foolish. The people that are called the Galileans. And so they started persecuting them. And the persecution came. Now... Come on to chapter 5 of Acts from verse 19. Now, uh, the story is that they are persecuted, they are arrested, and they are put in prison. And you know, one of the reasons, they were preaching the resurrection. And the Sadducees hated the word resurrection. They hated the idea that the dead will rise up. And they did not believe that there were even angels. Now, God did something here. The Sadducees didn't believe there were angels. They said, no, no angels, no spirits. Only the material world that we see. And then they said, there will be no resurrection as well. Once you die, you are forever dead. And you know what God did? God sent an angel from heaven. The very thing they didn't believe. And that angel sent from heaven told the apostles, now you go back to the temple and preach that thing they don't like the words of life. Now verse 19. 
And but the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to, all, to the people all the words of this life. We're now moving on from the persecution of the Galileans to the preaching of the gospel. An angel came in power, and this angel just uh, loosed their bands at night. And he opened the prison doors. He didn't need keys. He's an angel. That's the power of God. And he brought them forth, and he said unto them, That thing that the Sadducees hate. That thing the religious leaders do not want. It's the thing that you'll go and do. Go and stand and speak in the temple to the people. All the words of this life. Now, we, we have a long way to go. What I mean is, it's a long passage. So I cannot stand and, you know, I cannot just stay on one verse. But pick up that verse 20. If you're a preacher, underline that verse and uh, go. Stand, speak. That's a sermon outline. That is when you go, you must be able to stand firm wherever you are going. And you must stand firm solidly on the word of God. Stand with your two feet on the two testaments of the Bible, the old and the new. And stand firm on the two pillars of the word of God, both the old and the new. Don't stand with one leg only on the new, only on the old. Stand with both of your legs on the old and the new as you go into the world and speak you must have a voice if you're a preacher and your voice must ring loud enough for the people to hear you and do it in the temple do it to all the people uh, you see there must be a platform and there must be an audience and what are you speaking all the words underline that word all the whole counsel of God because it will bring life life to the people so they were commanded to go and to stand and to speak to all the people in the temple all the words of this life and when they had heard that they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught they began teaching the people you see if you will wait upon the Lord, if you'll be patient, if you'll not hurry out and, and uh, rush out of persecution, something will come out of persecution. You know, persecution is not strange. So don't count persecution as strange. If you will stand true in persecution, the glory of the Lord, the word of the Lord will stand out eventually during persecution. You know when Paul and Silas were taken? You know what the Lord did? He, he made the prison doors to be opened. And Paul and Silas, as they were singing, praising the Lord, received that miracle. And the Philippian jailer uh, just woke up. He wanted to kill himself. And Paul said, don't kill yourself. We're all here. And the man came and said, what shall I do that I must be saved? And he told him the word of salvation. And he got saved and his whole house. Because the apostles were persecuted. Out of the persecution came a privilege of preaching and out of that came productivity in evangelism. People were saved. And so uh, your persecution will end up as giving you a privilege and an opportunity to glorify the Lord and for the salvation of souls. Now we've, we've seen the persecution, we've seen the preaching, now the perplexity. In verse 21, the second part of verse 21. But the high priest came, and they that were with him, and called the council together, and all the senate of the children of Israel, and sent to the prison to have them brought. And you know, they set the stage, and they were fuming with anger, and we're going to teach these people lesson when we talk, they must obey. We told them not to preach and they continued preaching. Now we have blocked them up. Early in the morning, they just sat down. They wanted to judge these apostles that now have been under uh, security. So officers, go to the prison. Bring those peddlers of new doctrine out of that prison. Verse 22. But when the officers came, 
and found them not in the prison. They returned and told, saying, The prison truly we found short with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Think about the perplexity, you know, they were gathering together, the senate, the council, the high priest, the captain of the temple, and they were planning together, and uh, you know, one spoke out, how shall we question them? This is the question we shall ask. We shall, we shall ask them, who gave them the license to do it? When, when they didn't get the permission from us to do it, and we shall bring them under judgment. And now, what shall we do? Do we kill them or, or just uh, jail them or just beat them? What shall we do? They were, you know, preparing together. And they were saying, now, let's hurry up and decide before they come, because in 10 minutes they'll be here. And uh, the officers returned and they said, the surprise of the year. Our prison was as secured as ever. But when we entered, we couldn't find those people. And those soldiers were standing at attention outside. And they were vigilant. And we saw the door and we just opened the door very, very carefully. Only to find that the people were missing. And in verse 24, now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest said these things, they doubted of them whereunto this will grow. They were perplexed. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom ye put in prison are standing in the temple and they're teaching the people. You know, as you are laughing, the Bible says God will laugh in heaven at the people that are, you know, making conspiracy, waiting for God, saying, this is the road God will pass. Let's wait here. We shall catch God. And you know, God sits in heaven and he laughs at the foolishness of unbelievers and sinners. And God was having a nice time. A wonderful time just joking on the lives of these foolish people who thought that they'll be able to stop the word of God the work of God and the will of God they were perplexed and one came to tell them these men that you, you are waiting for here they are standing and they are preaching boldly in the temple we've seen the persecution We've seen the preaching. We've seen the perplexity in the gathering. Now we see the persistence in godliness. Eventually they sent for them. And now from verse 26, then went the captain with the officers. Have you noticed that? The officers went before. Now went the captain with the officers and brought them without violence for they feared the people lest they should have been stoned uh, those people in the temple they were listening to the word they were soaking in the word of god they were interested in the word of god the word of god was changing and transforming them they were repenting they were under conviction they were so happy the word of god was was coming on when the captain came in and he saw them very very quietly he, he talked to the apostles and said, please, excuse me, let's go. They couldn't use violence on them because when they saw the congregation, when they saw the, the, pop, the people that were listening, they feared that if they used any violence on those apostles, they might have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them uh, before, before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, did we not strictly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, ye have filled your, with your doctrine, and we have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine, and you intend to bring this man blood upon us. Look at the persistence. Holding on to the truth. Standing by the truth. Not allowing themselves to be afraid or intimidated. intimidated. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers, he started another message. This man can preach. He had just finished another preaching in the temple, but the angel had said, you speak to the people all the words of this life. And now when they questioned him and they said, 
did we not command you not to teach in this name? He started again and he said, We ought to obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up. Who is he? His name is Jesus. Whom ye slew, and you hanged him on a tree. Him has God exalted with, the right, with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things. And so also is the Holy Ghost whom God has given to them that obey him. What a challenge. Persistence. Persistence. You know, whatever is happening to you, you are now a Christian, you are now a believer, be persistent. And know that during persecution, obey God rather than men. There will be so very many voices calling upon you. Do this, do that. Voices of temptation, voices of trial, wanting to send you back from the way of righteousness, the way of holiness. Your answer is, we ought to obey God rather than men. Many things that the people of the world will want you to do. Religious people will want you to do. Things that are against the commandment of the Lord, the way of the Lord. There are so many I cannot begin to name them one by one. You must not submit to anything that contradicts or goes against the very word of God. People can call you to immorality, to evil, to corruption, or to sin, secret or public, social or peculiar. Whatever sin it may be, you must say, we ought to obey God rather than men. There have been times when religious people, even preachers, will tell born-again Christians, they'll tell them to do things that are wrong, and they'll say, well, I'm also a preacher. I'm also a Christian like yourself. And if what they are calling you to do is against the word of God, you must say, we ought to obey God rather than men. And so the apostles stood their ground. They were persistent, very, very persistent. And that made the people angry. Now, as they were persistent in godliness, that's the way the apostle Paul was persistent in godliness. And in the preaching of the gospel, Come to Acts chapter 28, verse 16 and verse 17. And when we came to Rome, the centurion delivered the prisoners to the captain of the girl. But Paul was suffered that is permitted to dwell by himself with a soldier that kept him. And it came to pass that after three days, Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, Though I have committed nothing against the people or the customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. He was delivered as a prisoner because of the preaching of the gospel. And then he called these people together, the chief among the, uh, among the Jews. In verse 23, And when... They had appointed him a day. There came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses and out of the prophets from morning till evening. Remember, he was with a soldier. He was chained. He was, uh, if you like, in detention because of the preaching of the gospel. And right there, he called all these people together and he was expounding to them and teaching them, testifying to them of the kingdom of God and of Jesus Christ. And some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not. In verse 30, and Paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came in unto him, preaching the kingdom of God, and teaching those things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ, with all confidence, no man forbidding him. That's persistence. Persistence. In, in um, Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. You know, he went to Rome, and he was imprisoned in, in Rome. And all the time he was in that prison, because of the preaching of the gospel, he said, the word of God is not bound. Even though I am in chains, even though I am 
being persecuted, the word of God is still freely flowing out. Now, before I read um, Philippians chapter 4, verse 22, look at the small lettered words at the end of Philippians. After verse 23, it was written to the Philippians from where? From Rome and sent by Epaphroditus. While Paul was in the prison, he was persistent. He kept on writing letters to the churches that he couldn't see by face. That's persistence. And he kept on receiving people that will hear the preaching of the gospel from his mouth. That is persistent. And he kept on praying and praising the Lord. And he kept on encouraging the people of God with his epistles and letters. That is persistence. And he kept on preaching the kingdom of God. And preaching that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. That is persistence. And now verse 22. While he was there in Rome, all the saints salute you. Talking to the Philippians. Chiefly, they that are of Caesar's household. What's the meaning of that? They took him to Caesar so as to judge him. He said, I appeal unto Caesar. And he said, okay, have you appealed unto Caesar? Unto Caesar thou shalt go. And so they took him to Rome. And while he was waiting to be judged by Caesar, the household of Caesar, some of them were coming. Paul will be hearing about you the great criminal of the land and he started preaching the gospel to them and before they even could judge him many people in the household of caesar had believed and while he was writing to uh, the philippians he said do not be discouraged by these bonds do not be discouraged by the imprisonment that i suffer in fact saints are greeting you from here and chiefly the saints of caesar's household who have been converted since i came here they are greeting you as well that's persistence. And you know, as Christians, whatever it may be, keep on keeping on. Whatever we suffer, whatever ridicule or shame or misunderstanding, keep on keeping on. Be persistent. Now, Acts chapter 5. Now, they came together. These Galileans were being persecuted. The angel delivered them and they came into uh, the... They came into the temple and they preached the gospel. And as the council came together, they were perplexed because they couldn't see these apostles in the prison. They found them in the, in the temple eventually. And they brought them together and the only thing they could get out of them was that they would be persistent in godly living and in preaching the gospel. And they started preaching to even the council and it enraged them the more. Verse 33 of Acts chapter 5. When they heard that, they were caught to the heart and took counsel to slay them. They really got angry now. And they said, it's not only imprisonment now. We're going to kill them. They took counsel to slay them. Now, we come to the proposal of Gamaliel. Follow all that we're saying. Persecution of the Galileans, then the preaching of the gospel, then perplexity in the gathering, then persistence in godliness. Now, proposal of Gamaliel. As uh, these people were determining that they will kill the apostles and just end it up all together. Verse 34. Then, st then stood there up one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation great respect among all the people and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. Look up at me here. God is very wonderful. He's an all-powerful God, an all-wise God, an all-sufficient God. But again, don't be surprised. God works in mysterious ways. You know, I remember the children of Israel. They were in Egypt. 
and the people in Egypt, they decided they are going to kill all the male children that are born. Because if they didn't kill them, a time may come when a powerful Israelite will rise up and then will just make all the Israelites to go against the Egyptians and they will just go away from them. They'll, they'll just gather together with the enemies and then they'll run away. And they didn't want that. So they were killing all the babies that were born that were males that were boys. And then Moses was born. And eventually, because the mother and the father couldn't hide him, they put him on, on the sea, on the river. And, uh, you know, it was Pharaoh that gave the commandment to kill all the Israelites that were born to be male. And now the daughter of Pharaoh came to the riverside and saw Moses, the little boy, and that little boy cried. And the daughter of Pharaoh said, This is a child of one of the Egyptians. And he took him. And Miriam came out and said, Shall I go and find a nurse for you? And she said, Oh yes. And went and called the mother. And this daughter of Pharaoh gave Moses to the mother and said, Now you must help me take care of this child. And I will be paying you your salary. Your money will not fail. Take care of the child for me. And uh, the Moses mother said, Yes, madam, I'll do that for you. And God spent the money of Egypt to train up the leader of the children of Israel that would deliver the children of, His the of Israel from Egypt. That is the way of God that he can choose a person in the midst of the unbelievers, in the midst of the sinners, even among the people that are gathering together to kill and to destroy and to put to an end the way of God. And God can choose one of them at their own expense. They will spend the money and take care of the leader that will deliver the children of Israel. It's God. That is the way God works. And God is still doing it today. You remember when Cyrus, a king, a gentle king, was reigning, when he was having the empire, you know what he said? He said, all the Israelites, they must go back to their land. And they must build Jerusalem, who is here among you, whom the Lord has stirred up his heart. Go back to your land and go and build the place. You remember Nehemiah? Nehemiah was serving a gentle king. And the gentle king looked at his face and said, You are sad. What's the matter with you? He said, How oh, will I not be sad when the sepulchre of my father and the gates of Jerusalem, when it is just in, all in rubbish? And he said, What do you want? And the queen was sitting by his side and he said, If you'll give me the letters and the permission, I'll go back to build. And he gave him the letter, the permission, everything that was needed. And Nehemiah went to build the city. You know what I'm telling you? It, that's not the first time God will use the people of the world to confound the people of the world and to make his work to be going on. Now, the council was meeting. And Gamaliel, a doctor of the law. Now, listen to me. God can use, listen to me, God can use doctors of the law to deliver the preachers of grace. Think about it. That's deep. The law was being abolished because of Jesus Christ, because of the cross, because of the blood of Jesus. The law was being abolished and grace was replacing it. And the ministers of grace were in trouble and God couldn't find anybody in grace. And he found a person in the collapsing law to raise up and to make the ministers of grace to keep on the work. That's the work of God. If you don't know God, you'll say, well, how can God do that? He has been doing that from the beginning of the world. And today, he can still use some believers. He can use outsiders. He can use the unregenerate and the people that even are in the system of this world to carry on the gospel of the eternal kingdom. That is God. Now, come on to Acts chapter 5. Verse 34. Then stood there up, one in the council, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a doctor of the law, had in reputation among all the people, and commanded to put the apostles forth a little space. And he said unto them, Ye men of Israel, take it to yourselves what ye intend to do as touching these men. For before these days rose Theodas, 
boasting himself to be somebody to whom a number of men, about 400, joined themselves, who was slain, and all, as many as obeyed him, and were scattered and brought to naught. After this man rose up Judas of Galilee, in the days of the taxing, and drew away much people after him. He also perished, and all, even as many as obeyed him, were dispersed. And now I say unto you, Refrain from this man, let them alone. For if this counsel or this work be of men, it will come to naught. Leave it alone. It only takes time. Be watching them. Be patient. Let things die a natural death, because if it's of men, it will come to naught. But if it be of God, Ye cannot overthrow it. You see him prophesying. You see him telling his colleagues and his, uh, and the people in the council saying, Listen to me. It is either of God or of the devil. If it's of the devil, it will die. A natural death. Leave them alone. If it is of God, ye cannot overthrow it. Lest happily ye be found even to fight against God. And to him they agreed. God has his representatives everywhere. He can use the wind. He can use the storm. He can use an ass. He can use the jawbone of an ass. He can use the rain. He can use the whale in the sea. He can use the sun. He can use anything. Even the cock crowing. He can use it to bring Peter back to repentance. And he can use Gamaliel. So why are you thinking God has forsaken you when you are in persecution? God has his own people. The Gamaliels are still there. Whoever will be used, God will use them and he will preserve your life and the gospel will go on in the name of Jesus. Amen. Think about it. When Jesus was born, they were pursuing him all about. Herod wanted to kill him. You know what God said? God said, Mary, Joseph, take Jesus and take him to a place. Not Jerusalem, not Bethlehem, not uh, any other good place. Where? Where? There you are. That's God. Egypt, where he called his own people out. The Egypt of idolatry. The Egypt of the Gentiles. Keep him there. I'll be watching over him. That is God. And you know, that God is still alive today. You may be in a difficulty. You may be in real persecution. And there is no believer around. There is no saint around. God is there. And he can move on the hearts of all the people there. And God will deliver you in Jesus' name. Amen. And you see, to him they all agreed. And when they had called the apostles and had beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus, and they let them go. Now, let's see the progress of the gospel. Verse 41, And they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing. Everybody say rejoicing. rejoicing. Say it again. Rejoicing. Say it again. Rejoicing, um, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in... Tell me out loud. Uh, but I thought the, the captain was in the council, the captain of the temple. I thought the high priest of the temple was there. And they commanded them, you must never preach another message again. And they went right back into that temple and the high priests were there and the captains were there and they kept on preaching daily in the temple and in every house and they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. Was there any result? Look at verse 6. In those days, the number of disciples multiplied. The number of the disciples was multiplied. Rise up and let us pray. If you are with God, nothing can overcome you. If you are with Jesus Christ, not, not Satan, not hell, not the powers of darkness 
can overcome you. You can stand and you must keep on standing because you know God has his messengers and he will send his messengers of deliverance. If he needs an angel to deliver you, he'll send an angel. If he needs a gentle, he'll send a gentle. If he needs anybody, he will send and he will deliver you. Keep on. Be persistent. Whatever the trouble, whatever the persecution, whatever the opposition, keep on standing. Keep on standing. Keep on standing. And let there be progress in the preaching of the gospel.